good morning. On behalf of the whole family, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today to celebrate David's life. I know at a service it can sometimes seem odd to celebrate, but we are celebrating his life and his testimony and what he meant for this church, for the family, and for Jesus and, and the life that he spent serving Jesus. So we do thank you. I think it would be appropriate that we start the service with prayer. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time that we had with David. We thank you for his life, for his testimony. Lord, we thank you for enabling us to be here to celebrate this life well lived. Father God, as we start this service, Lord, we ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to comfort us so that we can mourn as believers in celebration of David. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, including what you did for David. God, we ask for your, your, your comfort today. We ask for strength for those who are going to share a testimony, those who are going to share a word. God, that you focus our mind on your goodness. God, above all, let us rejoice knowing that David is in your presence at this very moment. Father God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we do have some songs that, that we're going to have this morning. And uh, the family wants you guys to know that these songs that have been selected were actually selected by David for this very day. And so during this first song, if you guys would stand as we go, it's the Old Rugged Cross. And this was David's favorite song. And so if you would, please stand as we, we worship this morning. You may be seated. We have Pastor Tim Strickland coming to share the eulogy and a testimony. Thank you. 
It's my honor to be able to do my little buddy's eulogy today. Uh, what an impact he made on all of us. You can see how crowded this auditorium is. And that says a lot about the life that David lived and the impact that he left behind. I'd like to read the eulogy part first. Uh, David was preceded in death by his father, H.R. Sonny Lowry from Shreveport, Louisiana, grandparents H.R. Sr. and Della Lowry, and Norm and Olive DeVandled, sisters Denise and Diane and Dar Darlene, two beloved cousins, Jackie and Lee Harris. He's sur survived by his mom, Carol Lowry, and his godmom, Wanda Simons, his brother, Matt Lowry, and his wife, Melissa, his sister, Debbie Al Albright, and husband, Chuck, his aunt, Faye Harris Cook, and Uncle Jeff Cook, his nephews, Elijah Lowry and Isaac Lowry, his two nieces, Brooke Patterson and Lily Shaw, his uncle, Charlie Lowry, many cousins, church family, and friends, and all of you family that uh, did such a great job with David. We just commend you for that and all the work and the love that you showed him that was just made such an impact on his life. David was born in Houston, Texas and resided in Spring, Texas. David was born with spinal bifida and had many disabilities. He was only expected to survive 15 years, but he was able to travel extensively throughout his childhood. He lived in Qatar and Singapore and traveled numerous places to Australia where his mom was born and raised. David was an avid bird watcher and outdoorsman and really enjoyed identifying with different species. David participated in the Cornell Lab of Ornithology on the project Feeder Watch, which he faithfully counted birds and recorded them for 26 years. He loved to talk about his birding adventures and experiences. He also loved fishing with his dad and later hunting with his Uncle Jeff. David graduated from Westfield High in 1991. He also completed a couple of semesters of college where he found it quite stressful as his mom had to attend with him. <laughs> I'm sure that was really fun that, um, who's that? This is my mom, I'm in college, so. David was a member of Believer's Fellowship Church in spring. He gave his heart to Jesus when he was young, but as an adult he chose to have a personal relationship with Christ and received him as his Lord and Savior. He loved being an usher at the church and working in Awana for many years helping with the children. He loved people and was such a joy to those who were around him. David loved to pick on people and tease people and he picked on and te that picked on and teased himself. David's ashes will be spread at his favorite birding place, Houston Audubon Society Boy Scout Woods at High Island in spring. You know, I've, I've known David for about 33 years. He was coming to Believer's Fellowship even before we got here to, to get to know him, and it didn't take long to love David. You know, I've heard that when one part of your body doesn't work, it seems like another part of your body compensates and becomes bigger and grander. David's legs didn't work, but I think he got a bigger heart. than most people have. And his heart overcompensated for those legs that didn't work, because boy, that heart sure worked. And there was nobody that uh, touched your heart when you came to church like seeing David with that big smile and that big heart, because he always had a smile on his face. And even when we came with our little minor problems, we'd see David with that smile and think, what am I doing complaining? He's got a smile. He's got a great attitude. Why don't we have an attitude like that? And I know everybody was touched that way when you saw David and what a big heart he had. When he lost his dad, I remember him coming to me and said, uh, Brother Tim, I always sat next to my dad, but now that my dad's passed away, can I sit next to you? And I told him that would be a great honor that you would choose me to sit beside. And so we were able to do that for those many years. 
And I remember when the opportunity came when we had the two campus pastor positions and I was going to take the campus pastor position in Magnolia. And I told Rebecca, it just dawned on me, I'm not going to be able to sit next to David anymore. And I told him that. I said, this is going to be one of the hardest things. I'm going to miss everybody at spring, but I'm not going to be able to sit with you anymore. And in David's pick-on fashion, the first Sunday that I was at Magnolia, I get a bleep on my phone, and it's him, a picture sitting next to Pastor Gary. <laughs> and there was no subtitle needed that said, you've been replaced. <laughs> So only David who would pick on me like that to, uh, to be able to rub it in just a little bit. You know, we can't say about picking on him without talking about his baptism. You know, when he did finally give his life to the Lord, uh, Brett Dickey, who was our baptism coordinator, and then myself had thought we worked through everything since, you know, we got to get him out of the wheelchair and we had to get up there and, and do the baptism. We... We thought we'd worked it all out. And so I got in the water, and Brett got him out of the wheelchair in that room and was going to hand him to me through that door right there. And Brett miscalculated and hit his head. Instead of just carrying him like this, he hit his head on the side of the wall. And then David, of course, goes, ouch. And Brett, to this day, says, I don't know why I said this, but I said, shh. He said, how do you tell somebody, shh, as you just hit their head? So, so that's how the baptism started. So I got him in my arms and turned him around. And as he's given his testimony that he gave his life to Christ, it dawned on me one more thing we forgot, that he's got his good arm around my back holding me for all get out because he's didn't. he just knew for sure we was going to drown him. So he's got his good arm, and it's his arm that doesn't work that's free and as he's giving his testimony I'm thinking oh my goodness he doesn't have a hand to hold his nose but we got to go from here we're already up here so off we go into baptizing and off he comes and he's choking and gagging and coughing and all the water's inside from that point on anytime we ever wanted David to do something he wouldn't do it so you know you may have to get baptized again and man he just fear broke over him oh no 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 not that not that anything but that please no no and uh, he would go crazy uh, if you even mentioned the word baptism you know as mentioned you know David loved to serve you know David was one of those people that didn't look what he couldn't do because he was in a wheelchair he looked what he could do. So many people in church say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do that, and they don't do anything. David wasn't that kind of person. He knew how to use the phone. He could call people to remind them about events. He could, in his wheelchair, pass out bulletins. He could listen to children in Awana say their verses. And he's been used in many illustrations I've used in preaching to say, why aren't we more like David? If everybody in the church would just see what they can do, we'd make a difference for Christ. And we, we're, we're all better people because we saw his attitude toward ministry, his attitude toward others, his attitude toward other people. And yes, he loved to pick on people, and we picked on him good. And so uh, he knew how much we loved him by how much we picked on him, so we couldn't stop and to keep on going it, but he loved to do that as well. And uh, I'll tell you what, with that big heart, I know we're all going to miss him. But he's, he's left a legacy for all of us. And I believe that legacy is let's serve more. Let's find out more what we can do for Jesus. And let's have that attitude that he had was, hey, I was born not being able to walk but I got a smile on my face and I want to serve Jesus and I want to love Jesus and I want to love others and we could have that attitude as well that people would see Jesus in us and I'm going to miss my little buddy but I know where he is and I know he's walking and running and playing and enjoying time with Jesus and that brings me great joy to where I know one day I'll be able to sit with him again in heaven. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Tim. So the second song that David picked out, that if we could stand for as we worship this, uh, as we worship the Lord through this song as well, is Till the Storm Passes By, by the Gaithers, if you would stand for this. So we have three family members and friends who are going to be coming to share a testimony. We have Dr. Charles Lowry. I'm not used to holding this uh, microphone, so uh, you'll have to forgive me. But I think most of you could hear me anyway. First of all, uh, I'm Uncle Charlie. I, uh, I don't call him David. I call him Devin, which was that's what we called him when he was young. And I never could break the habit. So my habit is Devin is uh, what I call him. Now, I'm, I'm not sad. I want to say that before I'm star. I know exactly where, where Devin is. And, and I'm going to see him again. So I had three points to make, and to close me down to five minutes is uh, really, <laughs> I don't know I can do that, but I'm going to give it a shot here. Uh, 
Devin believed the simple message of John 3, 16. So he will never perish. He has everlasting life. Notice that's past tense. He has it, and he's, he's using it, and, but he had it. And if you've all believed John 3, 16, that message, then you have it now, and you ought to be saying amen. amen. Second thing I want to say is Devin's life illustrates the beauty and the value of every single life to God as it should to us. And then the last thing, the third thing, is <laughs> has five points to the one point. <laughs> they say that great ball players make their teammates better players. Devin made those around him better. And I've already had that stolen this morning once. But I have five points to illustrate that. The first one, and you kind of could see it in some of the uh, pictures here, uh, is while he was three or four years old, he and my son Peyton uh, would be out at my parents' home on a lake, and it was big, and, and Devin couldn't get up. But Devin loved to play on the floor. He would, he would go around on the floor and, and pull himself around. Uh, and I'm talking about for hours. And when we would come over, I had, Peyton was my youngest, four boys. Uh, he would immediately, because of Devin's attitude, get on the floor and stay with him the whole time. He never got up the whole time. Now, I, I know that we didn't understand it at the time and comprehend what was happening there. But in respect, that playfulness of Devin, which caused Peyton to want to get on the floor and play with him, made all of us adult members of the family better. It lifted us. Thirteen years later, and you kind of, there was a video showing Peyton and Devin together. Uh, Peyton was going to a different high school, and we, in the middle of the semester, fall semester, actually early fall semester, moved into the same uh, neighborhood. So Peyton was a football player and a good one, and uh, he came in, and there was a table for the team. And so he was eating with that table. Well, there was also a special education table, and Devin was eating at that table. And Peyton went over and got him and brought him to the football team. Now, that sounds like that's great on Peyton's part, but let me tell you what happened. Devin was kind of adopted by that football team. He always ate at that table from then on. So he made that football team, that young teenage football team, better men. And then the same thing happened with the Astros. He wanted an autograph. And his dad took him down in his wheelchair behind a early before a game, a Astro game, and took him down and got that autograph. But it, it changed everything. All of a sudden, they were going down to every game, and Devin was sitting behind the Astros uh, team. And as a matter of fact, we were talking about this uh, on the way in. Joe Necro, one of the players, would come to the house and spend many hours with them and it was all because of Devin. Now, here's my point on that. He saw, I saw a lot of overpaid major league players who were really kids become better men. Joe Necro became a better man. He always greeted me with Uncle Charlie. And he would lay back and he would reach out with that right arm. And I'm going to tell you, if he ever grabbed David's right arm, he was strong. He was about as strong as anybody I know with that right arm. And he would smile, and he would laugh, and he would pull me to him to give me a hug. And that happiness was infectious and still is. And I'm a better man. 
the cause of death. And he left one final legacy, and that word's already been used today. And it's going to live on. And it is text messaging. He was good at that. And he would text message every day with his cousins. Not, not with me. I wasn't on the text message list. Um, but my sons were. And the last thing, we'd maybe be watching a ball game or, or, or doing something together, but usually watching TV, gun smoke maybe. But uh, Devin would get a text. I mean, Paul would get a text or Barry would get a text, and he would say, Devin says he loves you. So his intent was always to them. Hello, every day. I'm talking about every day. Hello, how are you doing? I love you. And the last text message that Paul received, he told me, he said, Devin says he's not feeling good. He's got he's to go to sleep early tonight. So what's happened is that spurred his cousins into putting a texting group together, which they call the Lowry Family Text Message Group. And there's at least 10 cousins that are on that list. And every day since we got that message of Devin passing away, there have been text messages from 6 in the morning until midnight. So what he's done, his presence made that whole family better. And I thank God for Devin. And I know that he's celebrating. He's not looking back. So God bless you all. And uh, I just thank God I knew Devin. Sorry about the name. So we have David's uncle, Jeff Cook, coming. And, and just so you know, Jeff, Charles was telling me before service that he's the favorite uncle. <laughs> I'll let y'all work that out. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, um, I, I kind of had a plan of what I was going to say, and then I didn't have a plan, and then I thought I'd just come up and wing it and just talk about the man. Amen. You know, Davey, I knew him for 30-something years, and it was an amazing ride. It was a lot of fun and um, a lot of love and a lot of laughs, and Matt's just sitting there laughing already because he knows some of the stories I'm going to tell. But, you know, the first time I met David, he was young. It was, like I said, it was about 32 years ago. And I remember walking into his bedroom downstairs, and as I walked across, he wanted to greet me with a hug, which I'm all good with greeting with a hug. I love to hug. But as I leant down to greet him, he grabbed a hold of me. Then he grabbed a hold of my head, and he pulled it up and just whacked one right on my lips. And I turned around to my wife, and I went, and she goes, it's all right. <laughs> That's just the way he greets. <laughs> and I'm like, so I thought, okay, well, that's probably the first greeting, and there won't be another one. Well, for 32 years, he kissed me on the lips every time I saw him. And um, it's, just, it's just who he was. It took a while to get used to that. But he was just a lot of fun. And I loved that. I loved that man. I loved that boy like um, you couldn't imagine. And he truly did change people's lives. Everybody David came in contact with, he touched. He touched in a special way. And um, I've got stories that I could tell you, um, but I really could take a couple hours just to tell you those stories. And I promise you some of them are funny, but I'm just going to share a couple with you just quickly. But this Davies, he wanted to please everybody. And by wanting to please everybody, sometimes it caused a lot of mess <laughs> and a lot, a lot of confusion. And I remember when uh, Matt can relate to this because he's done it too, but I'd go hunting with him. And I'd be in the blind and I'd say, David, can you see the deer? A deer would walk out and he'd go, yeah, yeah, I got it. I'd say, David, you sure you can see the deer? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, we'll just put the gun on its shoulder and pull the trigger. And I'd be watching and all of a sudden he'd pull the trigger and he'd hit the deer stand. And I'd be like, I'd be like David, you hit the deer stand, it's over there. And I come to realize I had to get around behind him because what, he was, what I was seeing he couldn't see and he had such a heart to please, he was just willing to shoot anything that was standing out there. So it just, I mean, he shot trees, he shot a hole in his blind, he shot the stand, and praise God, he actually shot some deer, amen? <laughs> he shot some deer. But, you know, there's just one other thing that I want to talk about. Like I said, I've got tons of stories, but he was just, he was just such a special person, and every time I think of him, 
I want to I want to laugh, I want to cry, I want to rejoice just for the privilege of knowing him. I remember years ago when I first came into the family, I was just astounded at how just this boy wanted to love everybody that he came in contact with. And I remember hearing the stories about how he wasn't supposed to live long, how the fact that he made it as long as he did was just a miracle. And, 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 and purely and simply by the grace of God. But I want to tell you something. I've been around for 32 years now around David. And there was two things that took place. There was God and there was a mother's love. There was a mother's love. I've never seen a woman that loved and cared for another human being like my sister-in-law did. And yes, by the grace of God, but by the love and the grace of a mother that I've never ever seen love a child and do for a child. And most people don't know what she had to do for David. And I tell you, he was totally dependent upon her. And she loved him for 52 years. The last thing I remember, the last time I saw David, he was up in the hospital. And Faye and I were sitting there and Carol was over there doting on him like she liked to do, you know, in between slapping him, you know, and it was like, and she was doting on him. And I remember looking across and you can ask my wife, I said this, I said, look at the way she's looking at him. She loves him so much. And she just had this sparkle in her eye every time he looked at him. You know, have I got another minute? Okay. I forgot to put my timer on. I haven't been talking long, have I? But, you know, and I, and I just praise God that he had the mummy had because I really don't believe he would have been alive as long as he was. I, I know he wouldn't have been. But 20 years ago, something else happened. A person came into Carol's life and into the family's life, and that was Miss Wanda. And you know what? She established a friendship. And it was funny because how she originally met was she was being cared for by Carol. And then she went home and she decided she wanted to come back. Go figure. <laughs> and she wanted to come back. And she came back and a, fin- a friendship started and was established that would stand the test of time. And this lady, this wonderful lady, come up alongside her friend and begin to care for David just like he was her own. And she loved him so much. She loves Carol so much. She loves, I know she has family here, but I'm telling you, we're claiming her. She's ours. Okay? And you're probably saying, well, yeah, you can say that, but I'm telling you, you're never getting her back because she's a part of our family. And I wanted to honor both these women because Carol could not have done. Amen. Carol could not have done what she did for these last 20 years without the help of her closest and dearest friend. It would have been just about impossible. God knows what he's doing, people. And I praise God. You know what? And if I had to, if I had to propose a toast now, and I'm going to finish with this, to David, it would be this. It would be, I would say he loved, he brought joy. And I would say this, as we lift our glasses, I'd say a life well lived. A life well lived. Thank you. Thank you. We have Eric Jenkins coming forward. He is, he is David's friend and ministry partner. So I have a deal with Joe. He said if I didn't cry, he'd give me a dollar. But if I cried, I owed him a hundred. So, Tammy, can you take care of that? Because he knows I don't ever carry money on me. I'm a little bit upset, though. Um, I have a lot of notes for this morning. But when Pastor Tim came up here and he spoke after he did the eulogy part, and then Uncle Charlie came up and spoke, then Uncle Jeff came up and spoke, you guys were copying my notes, and I'm not real appreciative of that. But I do have some notes. Matt, you have those notes for me? It's only going to take me a minute to get through this. <laughs> Page one. <laughs> David would enjoy this. Of all things, he was humorous. So I, I, I can't tell you, I can't go back in time and say 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 35 years ago, when I met David, because I don't remember meeting him. I just remember being his friend. 
The uh, David loved Bertie, as you guys already heard from Pastor Tim. He was an avid bird watcher. He actually performed studies for Cornell University that helped map migration and wintering routes for several species. He did this for 26 years, as you've already heard. But I think that qualifies him as a tenured, help me with this word, ornithological adjunct professor. I had to ask Miss Carol for that because she's the one that told me it was about the ornithology department. And I said, I don't even know what that word means, but... But because of his college professor experience, he enabled me to make an A on a paper I wrote when I was in paramedic school. Not because he wrote it, because he enabled that A because it was about him and the spina bifida that he fought and ultimately won over. And I say he won over, he won it over every day because he lived far longer than he was supposed to. David loved the outdoors and was a consummate outdoorsman and deer hunter and an occasional deer feeder if the moment was right. So Uncle Jeff, you had that right. He actually went hunting one time with uh, Philip in the back back there. Heard the shot, went over, said, David, did you get something? And David's response was, shut up. <laughs> Matt was with him, and uh, he actually shot the deer feeder. And David loved. He loved Matthew. Man, did he love Matthew. He loved to tell and make sure Matthew knew he was the big brother. And Matthew was the little brother all the time. David loved serving. He was dedicated to the service of the Lord and sought out ways to impact the world around him. He loved serving so much that he had different ministries that he ran. He wasn't satisfied with just existing. He knew he was called to act. One of his famous ministries was collecting change for mission work. And we used to dump in the little red white, I mean, the, the little red light thing was coming through. I never could put anything in there because Tammy doesn't let me have money. The other was, uh, the other ministry he had, he worked in Awanas. He worked in Awanas with me for about, uh, I can't remember how many years, Tammy? Five, six, seven years. From the day one, he would call me boss. Boss! I said, David, I'm not boss, I'm a commander. No, you're just boss. We would talk to each other, I would pick on him so much. I used to tell him all the time, David, if you just have enough faith, you can get out of that wheelchair and walk. No, I can't. No, I can't. He was always arguing with me about something. He also collected uh, food for the hungry as well. Now, a favorite was his work in Awana. As I said, he did everything with every age group. He listened to the boys recite their verses. He played games with the Sparkies and entertained the Cubbies from time to time. We actually got him upstairs a few times, right up to the point of getting stuck in the elevator. And that became known as the last time he'd be in the elevator. On his previous wheelchair he had, he had a release on it. He had to go back and push the release, and I would start pushing him towards the elevator. And that arm ever got a hold of me, he probably would have hurt me. One of my favorite things to do with him all the time, though, was sneak up behind him and turn his power off to his wheelchair. To the point that every time he would see me, he would turn his wheelchair to face me. And he's run over my toes a few times. But speaking of the one of games uh, and the one of kids, let me expound on this just a little bit. His favorite game was dodgeball. Let that sink in for a minute. In a wheelchair with one good arm, he loved playing dodgeball. And I have never seen anyone block a fast-moving ball with his face like David did. And he loved the kids playing and always loved when they ganged up on him and hit him with every ball we had. David loved kids. He actually referred to my kids as his kids. And that was okay, because he was my friend. When they were born and made their first visit to church, he was there to hold them with pictures that he kept under the little plastic thing of each kid. Man, that hundred dollars cost him a lot. He loved the kids, but he adored his nephews. That's what I have special for you, Elijah. He adored his nephews and his beautiful niece, Lily. In his eyes, they were the perfection manifest in the eyes and smiles of those kids. That's all he talked about when you guys were born, when you'd come around. That's my niece. Those are my nephews. And, of course, Elijah was always riding on the back of the wheelchair to look like he was pushing it, but actually he, was just, he didn't want to walk. If you listen well enough, 
through this little thing I've been talking about, you would have caught the theme of my testimony of David as David loved. You could take the, the little dash mark between his birth date and his going home date and just put loved there and take the dash away because that's what he did. Anyone who knew David, school, classmate, friend, family, one thing rang true and consistent is he made you feel loved and special. Everybody in here could probably come up with at least 10 stories of how they thought they were special in his life and only they were the, that person. David was my friend. He was also the only man I would openly kiss on the forehead and not be pushed away. Pastor Tim was the first man I ever kissed, and he pushed me away summarily. But David never did. And I was his friend, and he will always be part of my family here on earth and in heaven. Thank you. So this last song is Sometimes It Takes a Mountain by the Gaithers. If you would, this one last time, let's stand for the song.
Amen, amen. You may be seated. You're going to have to bear with me. There's, uh, there's going to be moments that the, the reality kicks in that uh, uh, Dave is not with us anymore. Uh, I was talking to Carolyn Wanda earlier today in the past couple weeks, and it's a new reality, amen? And uh, it makes us think about life. And, and Billy Graham was once asked what he was most surprised by in life. And he answered, it's brevity. You know, God's been working on me and, and showing me some things about that statement and that, that question and answer. And what I've come to realize is four things. It's fast. And it seems like the older we get, the faster it gets. Amen. It's fragile, it's final. There's a fourth thing, and that fourth thing is, is that it's futile apart from Jesus. You know, some years, a couple years ago, 2021, 20, 20, when David had that big scare and he had to go to the hospital and we thought that was and we thought that was the, the, the final time. And uh, I remember talking to him. I said, David, you know, man, let's, you know, we need to start getting some things in order. You know, what do, what do you, how do you want this thing to go? He said, just glorify God. Just preach a gospel message. And, you know, it, it, the, our Life is futile apart from Jesus, but for the Christian, we have hope in Jesus, amen? amen. And there's, there's really no better way to celebrate, celebrate the life of, G, the, of David than to talk about Jesus. So if you have your Bible, or if you have your phone, or if not, just listen to me. We're gonna be in John 14, verses one through three. John 14, verses one through three, and this is Jesus talking to the disciples. And he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, this, is, this wasn't just wishful thinking. This was a firm assur assurance of things to come. The reason why we as Christians can have this assurance of what things to come is because the source of our hope, and that hope comes from the Lord, because it is God alone that could, has the right to promise that hope. It is God alone that has the power to keep that promise. And it's that hope that I want to talk about today. For those of you here, for those that are watching online right now, because even back in 2021, and as recently as prior to January 5th, 2024, if you did not know Jesus Christ, his heart broke for you. David prayed for the lost, because he did not want anybody that he came in contact with to not to know who Jesus was. And so we have hope of a refuge a refuge is a place or a shelter. It's a place of protection. It's a place where we can go when the storms of life begin to rage. In our lives, we will face trouble. Problems will come. And as a result, we possess troubled hearts. And it's at this time, and this time specifically, that time of sorrow. I want to remind you of the hope that you possess as a child of God, that we have a refuge. And that's when trouble comes, we turn to Jesus. In verse one, Jesus knew how devastated the disciples would be and he was concerned about their troubled hearts. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. You see, he was speaking words of comfort to them. He was encouraging them 
to trust in him. And David trusted in Jesus. Jesus made it clear that his followers would face trouble. But he also reminds them and reminded them as he reminds us now that he has the power over any circumstance that we face. So if your heart is troubled today, know that you have a refuge. And his name is Jesus. So not only do we have a, a hope of refuge, Jesus tell us, tells us that we have a hope of a residence in my father's house or many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. As he told the disciples, Jesus promises us for a, of a better day and a better place. As followers, we cling to that same promise today that our that we have a beautiful heavenly home that our finite minds cannot comprehend. But if you think about it, the Bible tells us that we have the hope of rest in that residence that is waiting for us, and that is found in Revelation 21.4. And he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And although I'm, I'm looking forward to that that wonderful residence that Jesus has waiting for me. It is sad to know that David's not here anymore. And I do have a heavy heart, but I cling on to the promise that the residence that is, the residence that is promised to me is the same residence that David is now living in. We have a hope of redemption. John 14, two, I go to prepare a place for you when Jesus said that, I go to prepare a place for you, he was telling them, he was telling the disciples that I'm going to make a way for you. What he was referencing was the cross. You see, our entrance into heaven was secured by what Jesus did at Calvary. He was telling his disciples that he was going to do what they could not And in the same vein, it's it's something that we cannot do ourselves. Jesus went to Calvary, shed his blood, gave his life as a sacrifice for you and for me. And because of the finished work of the cross, we have the hope of redemption. Without redemption, we would not have hope of that residence. We also have a hope of a relationship. Verse 3, it says, if I go and prepare a place for you, that's a very personal promise. Jesus is saying, is what I'm about to do, I'm doing for you. So what he did for Peter, what he did for James, what he did for Andrew, what he did for Matthew, and what he did for the other disciples, he did for each of you and for me. Jesus said in Luke 19.10 that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Romans 5.8 tells us that God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we have a, the blessed privilege of having a personal relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And we don't have to wait to heaven to get that and, and enjoy that relationship. We can have a personal relationship with Jesus here and now. And those that have this relationship will tell you that there is nothing sweeter than fellowshipping with Jesus. We're also promised that there is coming a day when Jesus will return for his own. You know, there's a lot of confusion these days with false doctrine that everybody's going to heaven. And that's a lie. Being good does not get you into heaven. Going to church does not get you into heaven. Your parents going to church does not get you to heaven. It's having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's the message that David shared throughout his ministry, throughout his text messages, his phone calls, his visits. And oftentimes it was just through his smile that you saw Jesus. 
we have the hope of a return. Verse three, Jesus said, I will come again. You know, Jesus told his disciples that though he may go away for a time, he will come back, he will come again. When Jesus ascended, you know, Jesus has ascended, but soon, and very soon, Jesus will split the sky and come for his children. This is one of the most prominent promises in the Bible in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive will remain and remain shall be caught up together with them and in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. As Christians, we are to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the same thing that Paul wrote to Titus, that Jesus is coming back. This is not wishful thinking on our part. This is our hope that we find in Jesus Christ. This is the firm assurance of the things to come. That when Jesus returns, there will be a great reunion So it's never a goodbye, it's just see you later. Verse three says, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. There is going to be a reunion one day that is beyond anything that we could ever imagine. We'll have all of our families and our friends that accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior that have already stepped into glory. We are assured that we will see them again and we will long for that blessed reunion. And so we will see David again for those of us that know Jesus Christ. But more importantly, more importantly than seeing the loved ones that have gone before us, is that we will stand face to face with our Heavenly Father. And we will spend an eternity worshiping Him and praising Him. Revelations 22, three through four tells us the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his bond servants will serve him and they will see his face. We would get to spend eternity in the presence of our heavenly father. That's what we should be longing for the day when we arrive in that place, when our savior wraps his arms around us and welcomes us to our eternal home. We will see the say our savior. We will see the scars on his brow his hands, and his feet, we will be reminded that he is the only reason why we were there. And on that day, we will shout for joy, and we will humbly bow at his precious feet, and we will worship him for making a way for us to enter this promised land. You know, there's so much hope for those who have been born again. There's so much hope for those that have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And I praise God for that. And yes, my heart broke that night when David passed away and seeing him in that hospital bed. And just thinking and seeing him and thinking, okay, come on, David, just breathe. Just breathe, David. And holding his hand. And realizing I had lost my friend. Realizing that I had lost my brother. What breaks my heart more than that? My heart breaks for the lost. As it did for David. My heart breaks for those that knew David, but never accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so as we celebrate David's life, we as Christians have that hope that we will see him again. But for the lost, it's much different. For the lost, instead of hope, you are living in despair. One of the most devastating things you will ever hear in this life is that there is no hope. Here's the reality. If you are not a child of God, you have no hope. This is the closest 
you'll ever get to heaven if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can claim none of the promises that you've heard today as your own. But I have good news for you. There is hope for you. And that hope is only found in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to take a minute to, to read David's testimony. Now, this was written 10 years ago. And so listen to the words of David. I was born in 1972 with spina bifida. This caused me to have surgery at four hours old. At 14 days old, I had to have another surgery to put a shunt into my head. This was to release pressure in my head. When I was two years old, I had to have another shunt put in my head. When I was born, there was nothing wrong with my left arm. I lost the use of my left arm when I had surgery and got an infection in my right side, which affected my left arm. The spina bifida caused me to be paralyzed from the waist down, so I was never able to walk. I have had many surgeries in my life, and I was not supposed to live past 15 years old. Now I am about to turn, at this time, 41 years old. We serve an awesome God. And he had other plans for me in my life. During the times of some of my surgeries, I had massive headaches. I went to Spina Bifida camp when I, when I was about eight years old and did crafts, swimming, and many other things. On Sunday, the Christian Motorcycle Club, the tribe of Judah, came and did our morning service. That was really cool. I traveled all over the world and lived in Singapore and the Middle East and Australia. My mother is Australian, and my dad is from the United States. So I have dual citizenship and a passport for both places. I have observed several different kinds of cultures and learned from them. We joined Believers Fellowship in 1991, and in 1996, my dad passed away. I have four stepsisters and one brother. I graduated from high school and went to North Harris County College for two, year, two semesters. I enjoy birding, hunting, painting, playing games on my computer, and really enjoy doing the things I can at church. Let me repeat that. I really enjoy doing the things I can at church. I was saved at 15 and baptized, but I realized when I was 32 that I really was not saved. And on March 31st, 2004, I asked Jesus into my heart and to be the Lord of my life. There are many things I can't do, however, you just have to be willing and available for God to use you and do what you can. I enjoy working with the Wanas and my desire, and my desire for all of you is to know Jesus Christ as your savior and live for him. You see, David believed in Jesus. He lived for Jesus and now he is with Jesus for eternity. If you want to live out David's legacy, repent, believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and forgiveness of your sins. Follow the plan that is laid out, that was laid out by him. He died in your place as your sin substitute. He was buried and he rose on the third day, showing his power over death, death, the devil, and our own depravity. If you surrender to him, accept him as your Lord and Savior, and accept his offer of eternal life, then you can have hope of the things that were discussed this morning. And so as we close, I'm gonna read that last words from David. My desire for all of you is to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and live, with, live for him. That's the gospel message that David would want you to hear today is that he loves you, he loved you. And it broke his heart if you did not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now this time of, of celebration and, and mourning, you know, it, there were all the people out there this morning celebrating and cutting up and laughing. And 
that's great. And it's great that y'all are here for Carol and Wanda and the family. But I would ask that you look past today because we will all go all about our lives. But like so many of us that have lost loved ones, it's a new reality. You gotta remember everything in Carol and Wanda's life was centered around David. The house that they're in right now, the cars that they drive, when they get up, when they eat, when they go to sleep, all were revolved around David. And so I would ask that we continue to follow up with text messages and emails. I think on the back of the brochure, there's a way to get in contact with Carol. Show her your love today, show them your love today, but continue to show your love for them by continuing to be there for them. It's always at these events, at funerals and things like that. Everybody says, we need to do this more often. It's sad that these things bring people together. And then we say, we should do this more often. And then life just gets in the way. I implore you, don't let life get in your way. Take time to pray for them. Take time to comfort them. You know what they enjoy most, most than anything else is people going to their house and having coffee or tea with them. That costs nothing. Like I said, life is fast, it's fragile, and it's final. Why not enjoy loving on the people that love you and sharing Jesus with each other, amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father. We thank you for the life of David, Father. We thank you for the blessing that he blessed us with, Father. Father, because we are better people knowing David, Father. There were so many times we, we were, where we might not have been motivated, but seeing David and knowing David was gonna be there, Father, it gave us that extra motivation to be here, Father. Thank you for using him, Father, as a vessel for you, Father. Father, I pray for Carol and Wanda and Matt and Melissa and the boys and the families and the cousins and the uncles, Father. I pray that you comfort them during, the, during this time, Father. I pray that they seek your face, Father, that you speak to them in a, in a way that only they can hear you, Father. But more importantly, Father, I pray right now, Father, that if there is somebody here, Father, that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, Father, that today be their day, Father. As we celebrate the life of David, Father, we also celebrate the birth of, of a new person, uh, uh, of somebody that has accepted you, Father. Father, we just thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One thing I think that we've totally established here today, that David was an avid outdoorman, other than the love that he showed for one another, for people that came across his path. And he was an avid, as Eric put it so famously, he's an avid bird watcher. Now, David loved to go bird watching. He spent countless hours doing that. I can't even count the miles that my sister and myself and my husband and Wanda spent driving from, um, from way down south, down around McAllen, out to uh, Big Ben, uh, Waco, the hill country, you name it. And that's one of the reasons David's ashes is going to be spread down at High Island. That was one of his favorite places to go along with Anahuac. But today, uh, because David was such an avid bird watcher and he loved to do that, we want to honor that memory today. And what we're going to do today in honor of that, Eric, I'm going to take it just one step further, and we're going to do a white dove release today. Now, for those of you who have never done that, 
or participated or have never seen one. I have a lot of questions over the years. I've had people ask me, what happens to these birds when you release them? Do they go out into the wild? How do they survive? Do they die or whatever happens to them? Well, the white doves that we're going to release today are uh, part of the rock dove family. Uh, they're actually white homing pigeons. Now, white homing pigeons are trained and given a God-given ability to want to go home. And that's exactly where they're going to do. They're going to go home. When we release them today, they'll fly off and they'll head straight home. And I want to tell you, before you get back in here to that buffet in there, they're going to be home too and they'll be eating their lunch. I guarantee you they're going to beat you back. Uh, they'll be home and eating before you are. But we want to honor David today because he just loved the birds. And the release that we're going to do today is called the Trinity Release. And with the tr Trinity Release, we have four white pigeons or four white doves. And the first one we release is going to be to represent David's spirit uh, that flies home. And as we release that bird and it flies up towards the heavens, we release three more doves. And they represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those three doves will catch up to the first one and take it on home safely. So when we do that re release today, we want everybody to be able to participate in that and to see and watch that. So we would like for everybody, um, when we do that, to follow the family out uh, out to the Porta Cache out there on the far side. But first of all, when we do this release, I want to remind you of something. In Psalms 55, 6, the scripture tells us, it says, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, that I could fly away and be at rest. And I want you to know on January the 5th, when David flew away, He's now at rest and at peace. And I say that, but I really don't mean that because I guarantee you he's not just restful up there. <laughs> I guarantee you he's dancing and he's rejoicing and he is skipping down those roads. I, I can just see that. And, you know, it's, it's amazing that the white doves can bring so much peace. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the scripture tells us, when he came up out of the water, immediately the heavens were open to him and the Spirit of God ascended upon him in the form of a dove and a loud voice from heaven spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And I know David heard those words when he went home. So this morning, we just want to thank everybody for coming. My sister Carol, David's godmom, Wanda, Matthew, the boys, Melissa, and all the family members. We just want to thank you for being here today. And after the dove release is completed, um, they want to invite you along with Believers Fellowship to come back into the fellowship room over here and have a luncheon and get to fellowship. And hear some of those stories my husband had about David. You may not want to hear, but they're funny, some of them. But we want to um, ask you if the family would just head on out and when they go out there go out under the portico and on the outside step out there family and um, that way you can see the dove release and at the conclusion of that come on back in thank you so much for being here